Um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of NewsCred. You guys aren't here to um, listen to me speak, so I'm just going to do like a quick five-minute introduction and a little bit of context, uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to our main speaker um, in, in a second. So um, for those of you, uh, you're, you, if you're wondering why you're here, hopefully you're here to learn about kind of a, a real-life case study of how um, Fifth Third uses not just technology, but also like some of the um, challenges and, and hurdles they had to overcome when it comes to both like people and teams and st organizational structure, um, some of the processes that they had to, to set up over the last few years working with us, um, and they're now really starting to see the success. So we want to actually bring some of that to life. Um, just very quickly on, on NewsCred, what we do, I think we only have two slides. Um, we're the enterprise leader um, for content marketing platform. So we've been around for 10 years. I started the company. We're about 200 people headquartered in New York. Uh, we only work with pretty large enterprises. Um, you know, we're number one in Gartner, number one in Forrester. Uh, hopefully, it's, you know, Sirius. If they do something similar, we'll be number one in Sirius as well. Um, no, we're, we're big fans. But uh, the f the on the bottom right, you can see, like, why customers use us. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I'm most interested in is, you know, how you can use technology, but also process to improve, like, the operational efficiency of teams. Uh, I believe, like, you know, better performing marketing teams create better performing content, and that, that results in a better customer experience. And ultimately, that's why we all exist, right? So that's number one. Um, kind of providing the tools and the tool set for content operations and governance, that's number two. Number three is kind of increasing brand equity and, and, and generating revenue um, for our customers. So those are kind of the reasons why people choose us. We have a software platform. Uh, that helps marketing teams with their both planning and execution. I talk about both, and I think a lot of times marketers, um, they do planning in one set of tools, whether it's spreadsheets or project management tools or Asana or Trello, and I see some of you guys nodding, you probably use all of them, and then they use a different set of tools for execution and production and workflows and measurement. So we bring all of that together. Um, we're a content marketing platform, so a lot of folks think like the use case is primarily content marketing, which would make sense, but we, we highlighted integrated campaigns here because we recently launched a product around um, integrated marketing. We call it the integrated marketing edition because what we realized is actually content marketing um, teams, it, it's like the tip of the iceberg. Yes, they create top of the funnel content, often content that ends up on your blog, on your blog or resource center, but there's so much marketing content being produced across the enterprise whether it's your product marketing teams creating um, you know, assets, one pagers, product sheets, whether it's your field teams creating sales enablement material, um, teams creating sales decks, uh, product information, like that's all content. Social teams creating social media content. And so bringing all of these teams together and helping them with integrated planning, integrated campaigns, that's actually a big part of our, our long-term vision. Um, you know, wh when, when we do talk about content, I think this is important. I was just actually talking to Caitlin at, at Lyft 30 seconds ago about this, which is a lot of folks are just creating content for the sake of creating content. But I, I think ultimately what we need to think about is like what are the business outcomes that we're trying to drive? So if you're trying to drive demand, um, you need to make sure your demand side infrastructure is set up before you actually start investing in content. If you're trying to drive lead gen, if you're trying to uh, improve brand equity, whatever those business goals are, you have to have like the framework and the operational rigor and the measurement tools around those things before you just start producing content. Um, because ultimately, I think j even though people are excited about content marketing, um, it's, it's going to be a sh very short-term play in the eyes of your CFO if, if we can't actually connect it to some sort of revenue impact. Um, I mentioned marketing influence revenue, so being able to tie content that someone read a piece of content or multiple pieces of content, usually it's you know, 10 or 11 pieces of content on average across our customer base, and then filled out a form or converted somehow, contacted sales, um, and being able to tie that content journey all the way through to a conversion event and, and, and to an op or, or a, um, a deal being created in Salesforce, I think that, that's the single simplest way to justify content marketing budgets. Now, not everyone is there. I think there's other things that you can do. People talk about thought leadership or brand equity. I find it a little bit fuzzy. So things, you know, when, when we are talking about brand equity, 
um, you know, share of voice is maybe a slightly more tangible thing that you can take to your budget holder and say, all right, you know, for this given topic, this is how, how much of the conversation we own versus our competitors, because I think share of voice has a direct impact on share of wallet. So I think it's a slightly better, um, better metric, although not as good as like the marketing influence revenue. Um, I think operational efficiency is undervalued often in, in companies. Uh, there's so much content being wasted or uh, so much content being uh, created in a, in a duplicate manner across teams or geos or lines of business. So oftentimes, it's not the lack of content that's the issue, it's the fact that we're not operationally um, efficient and not reusing the right piece of content. And I think there's, there's a lot of operational gains um, that, that we, can, um, we can focus on. In fact, there's a, there was a study recently, I, I, I'm fascinated this idea of like how we work today and how that's gonna change. Um, knowledge workers on average spend 60% of their time doing work about work and only 40% of the time doing the actual primary tasks that they're meant to do. So work about work is meetings, status updates, emails, like people picking you on Slack all the time. So it's not your actual work. So 60% of our day is taken up on work about work. So if we can use technology to kind of reduce number of meetings, reduce the amount of status updates that we need to do. I mean, how many times do you have a meeting where you walk in and you're looking at some sort of spreadsheet to everyone update like their row on the spreadsheet? Whereas if it was just a shared, commonly available, always updated calendar online that everyone can look at, you can avoid those types of meetings, right? So I think the opportunity to get, get rid of all this kind of work about work is, is, is a big, um, it's a big thing we're focused on. I think it's really hard to create meaningful um, marketing messages or content marketing that breaks through. We know about ad blockers. I think wh when I go to a lot of CMOs, the one of the first things I say is, by the way, most people are ignoring your ads and they think it's like a, an alarmist statement, but actually most people are ignoring your ads. So um, I think that that's an opportunity because we can create content that people actually care about uh, but this, this stat came from BuzzSumo, 50% of all the content that was created by brands uh, on average got four shares or less. And if you think about it, most marketing teams have more than four people. So your own marketing teams aren't sharing your own content, it's that bad, right? So, um, and it's true, you laugh and it, it's like, every once in a while we'll create something and I'm like, ah, oh, did the world need another article about like 10 ways to do content marketing better? And we create content marketing about content marketing, so it's like super meta. And like it's, I think sometimes just asking the question, does the world need X? Uh, does it need this piece of content that I'm working on? I think the answer is often going to be no. Um, we go to our customers often and say no. I mean, I, I, we had recently a customer say like, oh, you know what we need? We need an article about the insurance company uh, winterizing, our tire, winterizing your car or tires, something like that. Um, because you know people are going to search for it, they're going to find our content, and then they're going to become a lead in our system. Um, and if you Google like winterizing your tires, there's literally ten insurance companies that have the exact same idea in the same blog post, and it's just so so noisy. And I think we have to cut above the noise because people's expectations have completely changed. Um, just uh, I think there's more power in the hands of consumers than ever before. They expect their experiences to be personalized. When's the last time, uh, everyone uses Netflix here, I assume? Yeah, when's the last time you did a search on Netflix? Can you think about? Yeah, not many people do searches, and for those, you, you probably know because it's super annoying to do that search on your TV remote, like you're like one letter at a time. Um, the good news is Netflix doesn't care because you don't need to do searches because their recommendation engine is so good, they'll personalize like based on what you've seen, actors or actresses you like, micro genres, it's because they tag their content really well. So there's analogies in, in, in our marketing world as well. Uh, people want what they want and they want it right now. I think Amazon has changed that. Uh, we all used to like gate content because they're like, oh, how do we get leads? Well, we're gonna gate all our content, and make it really annoying for someone who we really respect to get to that content. Um, and we all thought that was a great idea. And frankly, people won't put up with that stuff anymore. Um, I know we, we still gate some of our content, but it better be like the best, most epic piece of content in the world if you're gonna gate it. And what we found is just give it to people when they expect it, how they want it, make it open. We get search benefits because we like actually open up our content. And then we figure out how do we upsell. We, we, we use this notion of like a content upsell. So we'll ungate our high value white paper, give it away, 
we get the search benefit. And then we'll say, if you want the same thing in PDF format, or if you want the calculator that goes along with it, or the spreadsheet, or the underlying data set, that requires an email address, right? So that's like a content upsell, but really give, give things away to people because they expect it. Um, and then I think people expect purpose from brands, and it's an overused word. I don't really care what your politics are, whether you like them or not, but like Nike has purpose. They stood for something and they actually, you know, they put a lot of their marketing might and dollars behind it. And there's a big group of people that actually like what they do. And, and purpose doesn't have to be like, you know, taking a stance in that way. Purpose could be like Fifth Third, who, you know, she's gonna come up and speak in a second, but um, they take very seriously that the people go through really important life stages, right? Whether you're having a baby or getting married or trying to buy a home, like these are really important, deeply personal moments in your life and they wanna be there to help. So I think that's the, um, that's, that's the, purpose can be anything but tied to your industry and I think people expect that. So we know most, uh, most content is wasted, most of it is poor and delivers, fails to deliver. Um, and and when, it, when it comes to waste, I think there's a number of different types of waste. There's waste because there's content that's not strategically like tied to any business reason. Like you just created the content, but it's not, there's no purpose for it. There's also waste if it's not correctly tagged because you can never find it again. There's waste if there's duplication, right? So two people and two teams are creating the exact same thing because they don't know something exists. So there's a lot of different forms of waste. Um, but I think the key again is to think about how do you reuse stuff that already exists? How do you translate it? How do you localize it? How do you adapt it? And I think marketing teams aren't really spending uh, time on, on doing that. Everyone knows like customer journey is super complicated. Uh, I think the way I like to think about it is, there's this slide, so this is like a super academic answer, which is like something about omni-channel, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what I like to say is, like, if your shit is broken inside, the customer's gonna see broken shit outside, right? So like, just think about like how, like organization silos internally, we're organized by channel internally, that we have competing interests, like the social teams competing with the email team, and that's different from the SEO team, that's different from the brand team, and there's another ad team. Like, everyone has their own goals, often they're competing with each other, they don't, they're not on shared tools, they don't have the shared campaigns, they're not working in an integrated way, so it's completely siloed. So obviously that marketing message is gonna be completely disjointed when we, when we expose it to our customer. And again, if we actually care and respect about our customers, I think that's like a, that's like the worst possible thing you can do for your brand. And the brand is like the most precious asset that you have. So I think this is not just like a nice to have. People talk about silos all the time. Every single one of these serious decision conferences, probably for the last 10 years, someone's talked about like organizational silos, yet we don't actually see those being broken down fast enough. But I think there's ways to now do that because of technology, because there's tools that can provide visibility or just learning from each other around like what we've done with people and process. So. Um, I think what we're going to talk about is, you know, both how we structure and, and set up content teams and content operations, how governance works. Um, according to you guys, because this is a serious study, uh, most of us are rated not advanced in operations. So, um, and when we think about operations, we think about these three things. Uh, I think Chan's going to talk about people, process, and platform. On the people side, there's Organizational buy-in, I think that's like an obvious one. A lot of, you know, anyone can come, out, come up here and say, oh, you need a CMO who buys into this notion of breaking down silos and providing visibility. Um, but I think that there's, there's cultural requirement that you need trust in your organization for this to work. And the only way you get trust to me is visibility. So it's, there's, if you, you can look at it as like tactical, oh, we put all our editorial or marketing calendars into one and, pr and now we have it online. That's a very tactical way of looking at it. But what that's actually unlocking is that when you provide shared visibility to your entire marketing organization, you can actually build trust and change the way people work. In terms of process, there's a couple simple things around this, like streamlining workflows and having the right workflows for the right types of assets, having the right taxonomy, just basic stuff around um, like if you don't tag your content well, you're not gonna be able to measure how it works and you're certainly not gonna be able to find it once it's published, right? And in fact, if you don't tag it well, your customers probably won't be able to find it either. So even basic things around process. Um, and then uh, again, I think technology will help um, kind of bring unifying those teams by providing 
kind of the capabilities for workflows or calendars or measurement, et cetera. So um, I'm gonna hand it over. Uh, Shannon's amazing. She's been she, VP of content and social, I think is your title, uh, something mm -hmm. like that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I was given like all these specific notes about how amazing she is, but she's been at Fifth Third. Before that, she was in healthcare. Um, before that, at Detroit Red Wings, I think, first social yeah. media manager there. Yeah. Um, but at Fifth Third as a VP, has a has a marketing team across you know channels, um, and they've done a lot of interesting work. Just in, just seeing the maturity of that organization over the last few years has been pretty awesome for us. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over, and hopefully you guys are gonna be all impressed. Not hopefully, you will ah. be impressed. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, just pass the baton. So I get to stand on this little stage too. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah. This is a long, uh, a long story, um, but I, and it didn't start with me, by the way. The meet cute, unfortunately, I can't give you the whole uh, detail around how, how Fifth Third met Newscred, but um, I can tell you when I started working with Newscred, um, we were my team sort of became charged with creating content for our consumer bank, and um, I started unearthing like a lot of different groups were working with Newscred, which was part of our. Uh, Part of our um, problem, I should say, not that we were working with Newscred and lots of different teams, because I think lots of different teams um, were were relatively, you know, happy and 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 uh, liked what they were doing. Um, it just became evidence of a lot of the duplication of effort and some of the the siloed approach that uh, Shaf was talking about. But um, I'll get into that a little bit more. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was that bad. There were three or four separate contracts, so it took me about all of a year to try and unearth all of the different agreements, the varying uh, services we were provided. We had several instances of the software that were being um, used or not um, with with different teams. So it was it was um, a pretty big journey. So um, we I, I spent the better part of a year really trying to uh, shore up all of the different uh, content uh, providers we had, the different teams who are producing content, um, you know, what that means for what my team was still responsible for, and then um, really making a case for centralizing how we produce content, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, so, <laughs> getting, oh, I'm going backwards, hold on. There we go, so yes, we needed an enterprise-wide um, content strategy. But the thing is, you know, a lot of us who are who are maybe more um, skilled in this area or have a lot of experience or working with blogs and understand how content works in a digital space, um, not everybody in a marketing organization understands that. So like the need to be able to produce something, understand how it's tagged, making sure it's tagged consistently, having a consistent taxonomy, um, a lot of marketers don't get that at all. Um, they're simply looking at the words on the page and that, nope, this is good, this is not good. Um, or the, the image selection. They don't really understand um, how a lot of that metadata and everything really fuels the entire experience. And that's becoming more of a challenge because as things like personalization and the ability to target customers on your website and, and deliver the next best piece of content, the right product page, the right imagery, the right messaging, um, that becomes even more of a problem if you're not doing that or if you're not doing it consistently. So we really needed to have just sort of an enterprise-wide content strategy. We were very, um, not just siloed in terms of channel, but we were siloed in terms of line of business. So in a bank, a line of business is like your credit card, your deposit products, your savings products, your wealth management group, your B2B, you know, we have business banking, we have commercial banking, which is like your large corporate uh, bank banking clients. So um, a lot of these different teams were producing content, but the thing is, and we'll get, we'll, I'll get to this a little bit more in depth, but um, we really had to argue that this, these are still human beings. <laughs> and even if they're a CFO of a large corporation, they might still need a mortgage, <laughs> you know, and we don't know, it's not, we don't have enough data to really decide what's best for them. So there was a lot that really went into, and having to convince people to do this. So um, the result is we're now producing about, I have one person dedicated to content on my team. And now we have fewer people actually doing content marketing because I have one, <laughs> one dedicated. Um, and we're producing about three times more content than we did when it was sporadically being produced by different teams across the organization. Um, so we're, we're now getting about 50 pieces per quarter-ish, depending on you know, the length and you know, just, just to give you a sense of how much. 
um, which is not, you know, definitely not an article every day. You know, we're not Chase, we're not American Express. <laughs> you know, we don't have the, the, you know, teams of people really working on this, but um, we've, we've come a long way in a short time, and I would say it's been less than a year that we've really been, that we, since we've uh, consolidated all this. So we really started um, hitting the ground running in Q2 of this year. But um, we've, we've been able to do a long, uh, to get a lot of the operational effectiveness in place in a very short time. And that's um, both, you know, Scott, who's on my team, and, and the team that we work with at NewsCred. So how we did this. Oh, the people. The people are the hardest part, right? I mean, you talk about um, the executive buy-in. A lot of times you think, well, if I just got the, you know, the most important person here to say that this is important, everything will go smoothly. That never <laughs> happens because the people who are the, the obstacles are the people who were like, you know, the people who really fought to have their own little um, content practice within their line of business and were really trying to, um, to get their own little, you know, operation up and running. Um, that was, you know, their, that was their baby, you know. Um, you, you have people who don't believe that it needs to be centralized or, you know, somebody working in a center of excellence will never understand the nuance of my line of business or my product. It's, it's much too complicated and, and we need people who are much more entrenched with the line of business. You know, you'll hear a lot of different arguments, but, um, you know, the, the problem was never, oh gosh, I did not make this slide, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, the problem was never, um, having an executive buy-in, although executive buy-in is important, um, it was always about, and, and even our executive, our CMO would push back to me and say, who have you talked to about this? Who are you working with on this? Have you, ta have you met with that? You know, so it's, it's, it's on me now to go around and start to, to really um, help other people understand that this is important, that we will not just throw your baby out the window, <laughs> not, the thing that you've been working to nurture and get up and running, we're actually gonna work with you to make it better. Um, we're, not go, it's not, we're not taking this away from you, we just wanna partner with you. Um, and, and really trying to get you know, more, um, you know, it's, it's about the how you do it. You know, nobody wants to have the boss come in and tell them, um, now we're centralizing content, go work with this person. Like they don't, why would they do that? You know, you, you, you have to really, spend a lot of time or somebody told me sometimes you have to slow down to speed up and it was really going through that process and meeting with all the teams individually um, you know still there was there was a lot of you know nervousness we had to take time to build trust even after it was like the decision was made to centralize content marketing on my team you know we still had to do quite a bit to make sure that everybody understood the process more than they probably needed to um, in terms of their their job function their role but we were in, in many ways probably overly deferential, like we wanna understand, here's the calendar, let's meet, let's decide, let's talk about who's approving, who's just reviewing, all of that good stuff. Because we had, we had a lot of work to do, even once we had the permission to really take ownership of this practice, um, we really had to build consensus and build trust and make sure that we delivered on the promises um, that we made. Um, so yes, this is all, we basically created a steering committee that's made up of all of these pe very important people in our, in our department. It's basically our CMO and all of his direct reports, including my boss, Dennis Giulio, who's the head of all of our advertising and brand marketing. Um, and so it's, it was meeting with a steering committee, but we also had a working team. So each of those steering committee members would appoint somebody, one of their direct reports to be part of our work group who really, um, so we, we made developing the initial strategy that we worked with with NewsCred, um, we, we included everybody. We brought everybody along. We included them in the workshopping, the kind of understanding who all the different uh, customers were that we had to communicate with across the lines of business. And um, you know, we, that was a very, very important part of the process as well. We had a lot of people with varying understanding, uh, varied levels, I should say, of understanding of content marketing, what it was, what it should do, the role of that versus like a brand positioning when you're thinking about the role of our, our content versus the role of our advertising versus the role of our brand. You know, so we had, to, we had to really work with people who maybe didn't, they weren't expert in this. So it's, we had to bring everybody along. We had to start bringing and, and raising everyone's level of understanding around what content marketing is, what it isn't, what it can do, um, what it can't do, and what maybe we can do in phase one versus, ooh, that's, that's gonna take us, you know, we're a couple years out from that. 
but um, I think that this was a very important part of this. So we'd have a working team that would meet and we provide quarterly updates to a steering committee. And, you know, I can talk about all the reasons why to do this, but, um, you know, and I'm probably preaching to the choir to a, to a certain extent, but, um, you know, we, it wasn't, it was never that the content that other people and other teams were creating wasn't good. You know, the articles were great. The, the quotes from our subject matter experts were great. Um, but we'd have problems like they would, they would end up, and a lot of times my team would be able to unearth it because they'd say, we want to post this in social. And then we'd say, well, there's no metadata in this PDF <laughs> that you just gave us. <laughs> how, how do we auto-magically post this in social? So we ended up uncovering a lot of that. And um, you know, that, was, that was a lot of the, the issue. We had some uh, another team that was paying another vendor um, to format articles and PDFs so that the, the um, bankers could actually just email them as an attachment to their customers. I'm like, well, there's probably a better solve for this. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that we do. And I would say we're still not in a place where we're perfect, um, but um, we try not to let better stand in the way, or perfect stand in the way of better. So um, we've been, you say, we got our uh, bearings this year. We've been able to establish a publishing process. We've gotten a lot of the kind of gunk out of the works in terms of operationalizing, getting all the approvals we need for articles and getting into a good rhythm. We're still publishing to five different resource centers on our website that are completely disconnected from each other, even though we remember earlier I said how much overlap there is in terms of audience and um, interest from our, from our customers, both at the, con you know, the low end of the consumer all the way up to high net worth and, and our, our um, wealth management customers all the way up to from our small businesses to our, our large corporate clients. So um, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the types of content they'd be interested in consuming from us. Um, so we're still not at a place where it's perfect, but we've, we've been very productive. We got a really robust set of requirements to build out a cohesive content hub where it will be centralized, um, where the taxonomy and all the tagging and everything will be consistent. We'll have SEO strategy as an input, right? You know, we're still not where, where we really have a cohesive SEO strategy, although there's, there's, some, there's some good SEO thinking that goes into um, our, our content ideation process. But, you know, it's just measurement it was very inconsistent before we, we did this. Some groups weren't even measuring this stuff at all. And um, because they didn't have the resources to do it. And they, they, you know, when you have more of a centralized practice, you can have somebody who's more expert in understanding the metadata, working with those um, MarTech teams or the analytics teams to understand what we need to do from a process standpoint so that they can pull the data they need to measure. So there's, you know, so many good reasons to centralize this or to, for us, I don't know that, I can't speak to every business model in every company, but for us, it made a lot of sense you know, just given our limited resources, given the fact that, you know, we wanted to really make the most out of this. I'm like, you know, to be honest, we'll never be able to measure this until we really get consistent in how we're, how we're executing. So process, I talked a lot about this already really, but there's, um, you know, there's a lot of, going into the strategy, we really had to bring forward. Now we didn't have, all the data and all the quant, you know, information that we could to really build the strategy. So again, in the spirit of not letting perfect stand in the way of better, we still had a lot of good, you know, good research, good insights, um, you know, or good enough to get started and then putting in a kind of a learning agenda so that we can start to learn about our audiences. Um, there's still a lot of value that we get out of this. We, you know, in social media, we, we do a lot to, um, when, when we have people that are reading these articles, we're not gating them, we're not doing some of the stuff Jeff talked about, but we do remarket to them. And so we do understand now um, you know, how to, prospects versus customers, if they're consuming our content, a lot of times we serve them a checking offer, we're able to acquire them much more efficiently when they've engaged with our content. So we're able to you know, pull in those audiences and, and talk about engagers. Do you have a question? <laughs> I thought you were telling me I had no time left or something. <laughs> based on the topics yeah. that they've read, you can try and figure out what their intent is and then you serve them different remarketing pixels for that. Yes. Or remarketing assets. Remarketing assets, yeah. yes. Yeah. So we, we do quite a bit of that. Um, we, we are, um, and we've been, I think our team has been really creative about how we do that too. Um, you know, bundling similar topics together in sort of a collection in social media. 
um, and, and serving those. And then once somebody's engaged with content, we actually have audiences that we create off of people who've read our content and social. So we call them like 180 day engagers, for instance. And we do measure those audiences against other types and we build lookalikes off of them too. So we are, we're looking at people who've engaged with the content, we're building lookalikes off of those and we do know that we can acquire them as a customer cheaper than somebody who has not engaged with our content. So that right there is value. So even though we haven't gotten to the place where I can, I can tell you, you know, every event on the page and the call to action and how many people we've acquired organically just from organic search, who've read our content, like we're not there yet, but we are making sure that we put the right practices in place to get value where we can and um, you know, figure out how long it's going to take us to, to get value in, in, on some of, the other, some of the other lenses you can put on this. I mean, we, we also send out a newsletter too, so we understand some of our customers, what they're clicking on. We're, we're using some of the, I guess, movable ink and you know, dynamic uh, properties, so we understand which articles are getting clicked on the most and making that the top article in the newsletter. So there's, there's a lot that I think we've, we've been able to put in place in a very short time. And the big rocks, we have lots of big rocks. <laughs> this is how we, we look at content. So um, we work with all of those different line of business partners, some of whom were actually responsible for creating content themselves in the past. We still work with them, we, we meet with them frequently. Um, we talk about all of their objectives and their priorities and um, we make that a big rock. We have big rocks every quarter and then we talk about how many articles, how many pieces of content, is it an article, is it an infographic, is it a short video that we're gonna make to really accompany or to really make, you know, bring that theme to life. Sometimes these big rocks overlap in the different audiences too, so that's always really nice when we can make, you know, one plus one equal three, um, you know, whenever it's something that works for a wealth management audience as well as a consumer or a small business owner and a wealth management audience because there's a lot of overlap in our wealth management uh, customers and our small business owners. So there's a lot of, um, you know, really great things that we can do in making sure that we're using the content, like Shaf was talking about earlier, uh, how much waste you know, I, I, we discovered like how many teams were making tax planning guides every year. And it's like, hmm, what, where's last year's? <laughs> Why don't we just take a look at that and see what's changed, you know, or um, how can we make it better? Um, and, and I think that's often the, the thing. We, t we tend to think about life cycle planning in terms of killing things that aren't working, but I think you, you actually get a lot more value of that when you look at the things that are working, how do we make them even better? So um, we've, we've um, gotten a lot of uh, really good work out of all of this. Um, so yeah, we have language. I said, I, I kind of hinted at this earlier too. It's like, you know, when you talk about content, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Anything can be content. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> so it could, a product slick can be content, you know, yes, but it doesn't meet our, our definition of content marketing. You know, a product page, those are sort of, you know, those, those things exist in a different universe. So we had to really hone in on what we're talking about when we talk about um, content marketing. And then, you know, the mission statement, understanding the pillars, this, and this really starts to inform that taxonomy and how that metadata needs to work and making sure everything's tagged and you're really feeding that, that kind of personalization beast <laughs> and being able to deliver the right experiences to people. And governance, you know, accountability, it's, governance is, kind of, I tell people this is my secret passion because nobody thinks of me this way. I'm being kind of a brand person that's really focused on doing a lot of the fun stuff and, uh, you know, on, in content and social and working with a lot of our, um, our partners on, on content experiences. But I really, really have a, um, a secret passion for governance and, and making sure that we are being consistent, that we're applying the right standards across the board. Um, and, you know, say you can't, I, I know I feel like I've said this a uh, hundred times, but you can't get to the place where you can really get value out of content marketing until you're consistent, until you're executing consistently. Even if you're creating the most wonderful, informative, you know, lists and, and infographics in the world, if you're not consistent about how you're executing that in a digital environment, no one's going to see it, unfortunately. So all of that stuff that doesn't seem to matter um, matters hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's, it's the foundation from which these, all of this stuff is built on. And so the platform. So we do work with NewsCred. I think NewsCred's keyword tool is actually very, very cool. I remember when I first saw that, I think I saw it before it was out and I was like, how soon can we have this? Because 
for a long time with us, SEO is a big gap. Um, and so we were kind of, you know, making stuff up or doing what kind of ad hoc research we could, but having this built in is great. Um, it not only gives you sort of the search volume and the sort of average CPC, but it also gives you some of the most shared headlines in social. So you can kind of understand what people are sharing related to these topics. So I really do like having this as part of the ideation that, that goes into our content planning. I mean, for us, having a calendar is, is huge. I know we don't have, I will say, we don't have our whole team in the platform or like other teams in the platform, I should say, outside of my uh, team within our center of excellence. But um, we do a lot of exporting of these items. You know, we export things in PDF form where, so people can see it. You know, all those PDFs that we were talking about, people were paying to, to format. We don't have to do that anymore. And we can even do it when it's in a draft so that um, they're able to give, and sometimes it just helps other people understand the contextual environment or like how it's gonna look matters. So um, having some of that export capability is really important. The content calendar, being able to export this on, you know, and, and send it off to somebody so that, you know, we can share these things. We try to be as transparent as possible. Again, getting to that trust factor and, and um, understanding how, how content creation needs to happen within a, a centralized environment calendars, everybody, people, I never, somebody's gonna ask me for a calendar in the middle of the night. So knowing that I can just pull it down and send it off is always good. Um, I never wanna have to scramble to provide a calendar. Um, the collaboration, like I said, we're, you know, I have um, Scott who's on my team, he's great. Um, he had an agency background and has, has been um, focused on content marketing for a long time. He's worked with a lot of different vendors in the space and he actually has told me, and they, didn't pay, they don't even know I'm going to say this, but he did tell me that um, the software does make things much, much easier for him. So working with a lot of the other vendors in the space means he's working in Excel. And we all know what Excel is like to work with. Um, you know, while we, while it's um, great and we all depend on it, it's not ideal in terms of having a single, like a single point of reference for how we work and then going back and forth in email, you know, he's able to really um, collaborate with um, the editors we work with at NewsCred and the author and everybody who's working on a, an individual piece of content. I can go in and approve things. I don't have to, you know, have, I'm always, <laughs> <laughs> Working at a bank, they make our inboxes very small, so I'm always an email jail, I feel like, and so if you're sending me attachments, I'm like, please stop, um, because I'm like always two or three large attachments away from not being able to send or receive email, so not having to do that, not having people send me things to a review and approve and a, is a pitch or whatever um, makes my life a lot easier. And then just and said, this gets back to that workflow. So I, I go in, in in that workflow and we'll make notes sometimes and, and mostly just you know approve the work that's being done. So there's some there's some oversight there and it, it does make our lives a lot easier. Um, we also like having the analytics in the platform too. So there are analytics in the NewsCred platform. We work, um, so this is not a replacement for the way we work with our digital team in terms of analytics and like a lot of the on-page stuff that they're looking at and what happens after somebody looks at our content. But this is a good, it's a good and. <laughs> I think it's a good um, additive um, input into how our team works and having the analytics in there, knowing that the news card team can see the performance of these pieces um, helps them when they're, they're pitching us ideas and everything too. So we don't have to actually run a report and provide it. There's data in the platform and it does give us a little more contextual information about content. So like I can tell things like scroll depth in the NewsCred platform, which Adobe doesn't give me. And we love Adobe, but it doesn't give me that. So there's, it's a good, it's a good um, augment. It's not a replacement for working with an analytics team in my, in my experience, but I think it's a really good um, it's a good thing to have in the platform and it helps. And so this is really, this is what we set out to do when we uh, created our content strategy. My team is a part of a, a bigger brand team where we're really on the hook to drive consideration for the bank and um, that's, that's what we've, uh, we're, we're making good progress on this and um, we hope to continue. So the